the river of Langtang, rising from the Tangula Mountains of China, roars its way to Indochina Peninsula, where it is given another name, Mekong. Mekong in Khmer means mother. The river has nurtured not only the land, but also the dream of people. Tree of Trust is a Cambodian proverb. Between either people or nations, the trust does not grow from sapling to tree in one day. But if it is attended with care, it will surely grow and flourish. People of this land are wearing smile, which is beautiful and pure. They are working with the friends arriving from far away to preserve the lush mountains and clear waters of this land with the hope for a pleasant home. This is the morning of Angkor, so blessedly peaceful. Home in a tourist attraction, also a heritage from the ancestors. Most of the local people engage themselves in tourism-related businesses. Guo Chantu and his father-in-law plan to make some speciality food, which is typically Cambodian. When it cools down in the sunset, the two are on the move. In less than one minute, Chantu's father-in-law climbs up a 10-meter-tall sugar palm. He stands on a sturdy branch and cuts off the tip of the spike. There's juice streaming out from the cut and flowing into a bamboo tube. Sugar palm has been inseparable from local people's lives and is hailed as the national tree of Cambodia. In rural areas, an important criterion to judge the household wealth is the number of sugar palms a family owns. The juice is boiled once it's collected and made to palm sugar, supplying the family use and being sold to tourists as well. It has been a major source of income for the locals. Guo Chantu married his wife in 2007. To follow the Cambodian custom, the bridegroom stayed with the bride's family after the marriage. Chantu could have built beside the parents' house a new cabin for his own. But an unexpected change interrupted his plan. In 1992, Angkor Wat was listed as the World Heritage Site. The number of visitors soared, accompanied by an increasing local population. Intensive human activities imposed quite some pressure upon the conservation of the historic site. 
Cambodian Administration for Heritage Conservation issued some regulation accordingly, prohibiting the construction of new structures and expansion of the existing ones within the protective zone of Angkor area. Over the centuries, an old saying prevailing in Angkor area goes like, Stone house shelters deity, wood house shelters human. Angkor Wat is the residence for the deities. In order to have a house of his own, Chantu and his wife decided to move. The village of Run Taek is 10 kilometers away from Angkor Wat. It is a newly built ecological resettlement for the Angkor migrants. Compared with their previous village, this new settlement is far more improved in both transportational accessibility and water and electricity supply. Every household moving in was allocated a bungalow and a land of one hectare. 32-year-old Chantu was well-educated and socially tactful. He was elected the chief of the village. Habitation was reset. Life was refreshed. Yet, new problems occurred. When the original livelihood is no longer adoptable, how would the new migrants make a living on an uncultivated land? Today, a lecture on agriculture is given again in village Runta Ek. In this shack for public meeting, such weekly lecture has continued for more than two years. Lecturers on agrotechnique are from China Cambodia Agriculture Promotion Center. As a pilot village for heritage conservation, Runta Ek was not built simply to house the migrants. The administration hopes that while having their living environment and condition improved, the migrants can also improve their production and life skills. <laughs> <laughs> On a land of one hectare, many crops are plantable. It is no other than vegetable that consumes the least time to see the quickest return. Previously, the local people were not at all familiar with the cultivation of veggies like lettuce, pepper, long bean and so on. After the Chinese experts came and gave the instruction, the empty field is now thickly planted with vegetables. In harvest, the yield can supply both the family consumption and the market as well. With the instruction of the experts, Guao Chantu is now the model of scientific planting in the village. The once unattended land is made full use for organic cultivation. Life of Gao's is now easy and comfortable. More and more villagers move in from the old village. <laughs> there has been 103 households resettling in here. Chang Tu sometimes goes back to help the father-in-law. People who once lived in the protected zone of Angkor had hardly imagined that someday they could have left this place and began a new life elsewhere. As a chief of the village, Chan Tu plans to have another 850 households to resettle.
in the new village by 2022. In the middle of River Mekong stands the Silk Island. Seven o'clock in the morning is already the busy hour of the day in the old dock. The ferry boats are taking people group by group to their works in Phnom Penh, across from here. Forty-seven-year-old Sai Sok always starts her days early. She does not shuttle for work, for she has a job in the community's cooperative on the island. The cooperative was founded in 2013. It handles business of Cambodian silk. Compared to Chinese silk, Cambodian silk looks brown in color and has coarser fibers. Silkworm and silk product have never been unfamiliar to Chinese, as the first country in the world to cultivate mulberry and keep silkworms. China is regarded the hometown of silk. Traveling along the Silk Road, silk has spanned literally thousands of years, hundreds of nations and a variety of civilizations. However, it remains as soft and dazzlingly beautiful as ever before. to find the flesh and the smell is here popular look like the satay beef human vision is good it's hardly known when the silk industry started in Cambodia, but it's said that the techniques of silk manufacturing was introduced to the island through the maritime silk road. For the reason that traditional and superior craftsmanship of silk weaving is kept well in here, the island thus has its name, Silk. Sai Sok comes to the cooperative every day. In here, the women weave on site as also an attempt to attract tourists. They can have income by selling the silk products and additionally, charging the visitors for this show. It is not only a work of production, but a demonstration of ancient craftsmanship of weaving. Women working here are all from the poverty-stricken families on the island. The cooperative makes it possible for the stay-at-home wives to earn some extra for the family and meanwhile, taking care of the old and the young. The average monthly income in Cambodia is about 110 US dollars. Provided that she weaves three pieces of silk cloth per month, Sai Sok will be paid a basic salary of 150 something enough to maintain the basic running of the family each month. And the women, who are so industrious, always work overtime on their own initiative. Sai Sok's husband serves in the army and is only home once a month. Their 22-year-old eldest daughter, after her graduation from high school, didn't find a job outside of the island. Instead, she followed Sai Sok and engaged herself in weaving. The ancestral handicraft therefore found a way to be carried on. The harder they work to spin the wheel, the more in return they will make. And consequently, the better education the younger daughter is able to have. Same as the Chinese, 
Cambodians believe that hard work pays off. The hands can weave the delicate silk and likewise the beautiful life of themselves. Across the river, the city of Phnom Penh shows otherwise a different picture. In regard of economic growth, Cambodia ranks the second among the rising nations in Southeast Asia. As a capital of the country, Phnom Penh is getting modernized by day. However, in the suburb, Depot is holding on to the tradition. Upon harvest of every season, the whole family, led by Depo, would attend a big worshipping ritual and present their well-prepared offerings. Mekong and Tonle Sap are two major rivers in the Kingdom of Cambodia. They converge in Phnom Penh. In rainy season, the Mekong would rush into Lake Tonle Sap via the channel of River Tonle Sap. Water, therefore, may overflow the edge of the lake and thus nourishes the surrounding earth. The warmth and humidity of tropical area co-work to fully encourage the growth of rice, the most important crop in Cambodia. Sixty-two-year-old Depo has devoted all his life to one thing, that is farming. Depo was born in a normal family with nine other brothers and sisters. Life for the family had never been easy. In the father's mind, boys ought to go through more bitterness of life. At the age of 13, Depo began to work as insisted by the father. The job he took was farming. After spending 50 years of his life in the field, Depo learned the rope in scientific farming. He is now far famed for being a proficient farmer. Land is the root of farmers. When the rice harvest brought profit, Depot bought more land. Depot had dreamed to have a large piece of land of his own large enough to yield non-stop harvest all year round. When Phnom Penh expands in urbanization day by day, Depo sold his land in the margin of the city at a high price and purchased another one near Lake Tonle Sap with a low rate, which is more favorable for rice planting. <laughs> Over the past decades, Depo has acquired 20,000 hectares of paddy field, equaling the total size of 300 football pitches. He'd like to call his fields the rice mine, 
as if he were excavating the infinite mineral wealth when reaping the crops. To carpet the vast land with golden rice is Depot's ambition. Depo started by segmenting his land by one square kilometer per unit and managed them separately. He built irrigation works to divert water from Lake Tongal Sap. In this way, water of rainy season is conserved for the irrigation in drought season, assuring a constant harvest all through the year. Additionally, mechanized and assemble line operations indeed increase the yield and stabilize the quality. And now Depot's rice is steady in supply and superior in quality, fetching good price. The favourable condition of sunshine, heat, water and fertile soil in Cambodia allows triple cropping of the rice. If he can stagger the sowing time, 62-year-old Depot is supposed to work on the field almost 365 days a year. The dream of rice mine has magnetized all members of the family. The son-in-law plays the chief operation officer. The youngest son is responsible for the learning of planting techniques. And the eldest son takes care of financial issues. The acquiring of land is continued. To Depot, the 20,000 hectares is only his pilot paddies. His ambitious goal is to obtain 80,000 hectares of land before the age of 80. And then, he divided into 365 segments for crop rotation. He would make every day a harvest. ហើយថាទៅខ្លាយទៅជាតំបន់រ៉ែត្រូវបាទព្រោះយើងមិនជាយកបាន Full bloom of the rice flowers reveals a year of harvest. A Chinese company is now working with Depo, selling his rice to China. With 50 years of concentration on the earth, Depo reaps wealth, contentment and endless hope. Cardamom Mountains in the west of Cambodia is 300 kilometers away from Phnom Penh. The west slope of Cardamom is covered with Southeast Asia's second largest pristine rainforest. Water contained in the forest streams down the mountains in a course which passes by the village of Assam.
March is the pepper season. To the east of Assam village and close to the river locates the pepper field of Uk Chandi. In just a month away, the rainy season will begin. The family is now hurrying, picking the peppers. The soil fertile with hummus, in addition to the ample sunshine and water supply, ensures the superior quality of Cambodian pepper. The fine pepper of Cambodia is sold at three or four US dollars per kilo in the market. Last year, Chandi's 30-ton peppercorns were snapped up by the purchasers calling at her home. In the newly wealthy village of Assam, more and more families are moving into such houses as beautifully built as the Chandis. In her words, massive change has taken place in the village in recent years. Assam is lucky because near it, in the mountains, came some Chinese. Fifteen kilometers to the northeast of Assam village, the Stung Ate hydroelectric power project stands deep inside the rainforest. Li Zhaoyong, 42 years old, is the director of safety production of the power project. He is checking with the overhaul of the generating set. A work had to be done before the rainy season comes. <laughs> The poor power infrastructure has long been the bottleneck for development of Cambodia. In 2009, the construction of Stungate hydroelectric power project, with the support from China, was kick-started. Cardamom mountains are heavily covered by rainforests. The conservation of environment came to be the top priority of the construction. The Chinese therefore abandoned the general mode adopted by power plants for water feeding and replaced the open channels with tunnels to divert the water. Consequently, the forest was maintained intact. Assam is the closest village from the power project. Due to the construction work, Li Zhaoyong had to frequently visit Assam village for scientific survey and research. The completion of the project lighted up the village and moreover brought along another surprise. <laughs> A road built to facilitate the construction of the power project also linked Assam to the outside world. The village used to hold 800 residents. In the four years upon the completion of the power project, the population doubled. The mountains, which in the past had restrained the development, turned around to be a generator of fortune. This day, carrying the goodwill of all the other colleagues. Li Zhaoyong brought along some gifts for the kids. It is scorching hot in Cambodia throughout the year. In such temperatures, many primary schools are suspended in the afternoons. When the power was supplied and drove the electric fans to work, the kids here could finally have an experience that the urban children already took for granted. Through the smiles worn on these faces, Lee seemed to have seen his daughter.
Time flies. The forest stands still as if nothing's changed. Yet the village nearby has taken on a new look. In 2014, the construction of Stungate Hydroelectric Power Project was completed. The same year, another China aid project, the Phnom Penh Pusat Batambang Power Transmission Project, also Cambodia's first state power grid, was in its official operation. From the power station, electricity is transmitted through the power grid to homes throughout Cambodia. Checking the equipment and patrolling the reservoir is the daily work of Lee. He has now stationed in the mountains of Cambodia for seven years. An average span of Chinese posted workers in the power project. If there's no special assignment, the workers here have two vacations each year, meaning less than 40 days that they can spend with their families. The staff quarter of the power project locates in the highland, near the reservoir. Here is the home of the Chinese workers in Cambodia. Today, in Cambodia, the electricity self-sufficiency ratio reaches 80%. China aid power projects are responsible for most of the electricity generated. Local people say the Chinese built the power station and power grid, just like making the cars and paving the roads throughout Cambodia. Road means hope. In weekends, when there's leisure time, Bora would come for fishing in this river next to Sianukville, special economic zone, where he's been working in. From a sewerage treatment plant nearby, water is discharged into this fresh water river. But this does not bother Bora since he knows that the industrial wastewater of the entire zone has to be disposed strictly to meet the nation's first level standard for water quality before it can be discharged into the rivers and ocean. Seven o'clock in the morning, Sianukville's special economic zone sees the hustle and bustle of the city. Young workers of all around the country are on the run to the factories. And a busy day of 32-year-old Bora is just kicked off. As an assistant to the general manager of a logistics company, his main job is to provide service to the company settled in the zone in customs clearance and declaration as well as transportation. A big problem came upon Bora early this day. There were too many goods needed to be transported from the zone to the port, and the trucks were not enough. Leaving alone whatever works at hand, Bora rushed to the port. 
司机也是很累，他就跑白天跟晚上的都有跑，但这个是没办法的时候，我们不用，我们不跑，也不行，客户又出货，客户进货。With his coordination, Bora managed to make up the insufficiency of transport. The work of the day was finally done. In his years staying with the company, Bora has seen the China-related business roar. Bora got a job offer in Sianokville in 2011 when he just graduated from the university. At that time, the work schedule was not that tight. One day, the business can say will not be done. But now, seven years later, Bora has to handle an average of ten cases each day. Goods from China and other parts of the world transit in Sianokville. To keep up with the efficiency highly demanded by logistic business, Bora has to shuffle between WeChat, message, and phone call to contact with clients. <laughs> so far, 118 enterprises from China, Europe, and America have settled in Sianokville, most of which from light industry. Almost 20,000 energetic workers are engaged in the production. Industrial worker is a newly emerged community in Cambodia in recent decade. It means to the country a labor guarantee for the acceleration of its development. Different from the many industrial workers growing up in the zone, Bora dreams to become a professional manager, as he's also optimistic about the opportunity the port offers to Cambodia's young generation. Well educated, sensitive to chances and hard working, Bora has benefited a lot from these qualities that he owns. This year, he had his home settled in the coastline of Sianokville. In early 2018, Bora bought this house, perching on a hill in Sianokville. The house is still under construction, but every day, when all the work is over, he'd come up to the top of the building for a blow, seeing the change of the city. To Bora's expectation, being huge and attractive is how the city should look like. In his first meet with the city, as totally a stranger to see, Bora was overwhelmed by it. Yet, what fascinates him more is the infinite prospect of this city. Bora finds himself completely committed to the growth of Sianokville. Likewise, the young generation of Cambodia sees more and more opportunities coming on the way. Individuals and the nation, in a course of fulfilling each other, are proceeding at a sustained pace.
Cambodia has a coastline of 460 kilometers. Not very long, but concentrating the superiorities of premium seashore tourism. Ample sunshine, silvery beach, azure seawater and lush vegetation. Besides port economy, the potential of marine tourism becomes increasingly visible. Early in the morning, Heng Heng is traveling out to sea on his purchasing duty. Not far from the land, Emperor Island is well known for its sea products. Most of the islanders here fish for a living. Heng Hei is an experienced purchaser for Dara Sakor Seashore Resort of Ko Kong Province. He's discerning in picking seafood, even though with just a quick look at it. As always, the seawater of this area has been well protected and maintained a pleasant habitat for meaty seafood. All along the way, Heng Hei answered four or five calls from the restaurant. Customers have placed orders and the kitchen is waiting for his purchase. But his job didn't end at his return to the kitchen. Heng Hei is paid 600 US dollars a month, much higher than many others in the resort. Fluent in Chinese, he works as both a purchaser and an interpreter. This strength in the career is something Heng Hei is very proud of. Six years ago, Heng Hei left the capital of Phnom Penh and arrived in this newly built Dara Sakor seashore resort by his own. All his belongings were two shirts and a pair of pants, plus an ability that not many possessed, speaking Chinese. This is Dara Sakor seashore resort of Ko Kong province developed by a Chinese enterprise. It's a collection of seven scenic beaches and its name, Dara Sakor, actually indicates this feature. Today, Heng Hei has a break, rare for recently. He takes his wife and daughter to the resort. They plan to fish a speciality of the area, mangrove crab. Here is a special ecological zone where land meets ocean and river joins to sea, in which there's Southeast Asia's largest and world's second largest natural preserve of mangroves. A high demanding environment is a must for the existence of mangrove, which is a shared habitat for both seawater and freshwater lives. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 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 
看红树林带去泰国那边卖。现在啊，国家不让给他们砍红树林。如果没有红树林，鱼的它不会在那边生小鱼的。After six years' work in the resort, Heng Hei built this 200 square meter house with his savings. Every day, when he's back from work, and if time allows, he'll teach the daughter Chinese word by word. <laughs> To Heng Hei, a simple description to the Cambodia-China relationship is trusted friends. His beautiful life basically benefits from such close ties between the two countries. Working with the Chinese has helped Heng Hei to gradually understand the Chinese way of thinking, and he also attempted to experience and digest what China's change has brought to its surroundings. Opposite the mangrove preserve, Koh Rong Island stands in the sea of azure blue. As the chief administrative officer of the Koh Rong district, 50-year-old Tang Hu Liang has a special task today, to accompany some Chinese guests to research on the marine ecosystem. In a marine program, jointly advanced by China and Cambodia, Ko Rong Island is a key link. When He Liang first arrived on the island 20 years ago, it was heavily covered with jungle and sparsely populated. But the beaches rimming the island were as white as fine sugar. And He Liang, at the time, was a businessman. Koh Rong Island enjoys a particular fame for its crab daily production of which being about five tons in the previous days. Owing to the bounty bestowed by the nature, fishing has once assured the locals a time of plenty. However, overfishing resulted in a sharp decline of the fish resource in recent years. The economic pillar supported by fishery was wavered and a transformation was in critical need. Uh. 
Hãy đọc phim chân bài chân đi Thanks to Hua Lang's effort, Koh Rong Island starts to make a name in the travel industry with its reputation as one of the 10 world's most beautiful beaches. Tourists just disembarked from the ferry. Koh Rong Island is indispensable for their itinerary to Southeast Asia. Along with the boom of tourism, the well-to-do days return. But can the ecosystem of the island afford to have more visitors? This oasis of ecology in the hug of pure sea water is the greatest ever gift to the islanders. He Liang has in mind the livelihood of theirs, yet he does more to conserve this pleasant home. It's still early in the morning, but at the ports of the island, nine ships has been made ready to set off. Their mission is to carry all kinds of household waste to the 40 kilometers away Sianukville for classification. Waste sorting before shipment was a significant decision made by He Liang when he took the office. Consuming several thousand dollars per month for labor employment, package material and transportation of the waste. ដែលយើងឈូឆាយហើយកំបោះចូលទឹកដើម្បីកុំឲ្យ <coughs> The visit of Chinese delegations isn't a particular something for He Liang. In 2016, Teng Xin and his group launched a thorough survey on the 53 points along the coastline and worked out the 25,000-word report on Cambodia's coastal area. The complete report was highly appreciated by the Cambodian partner and commenced the bilateral marine cooperation. The sea is the common home for human and countless other beings. If in the past, businessman Tang Hu Liang was concerned about just the quantity and quotation of seafood, today, Chief Tang Hu Liang is carrying the future of the island on his shoulders. Three kilometers away from Koh Rong is another island called Koh Touch. 
where He Liang built a temple. In front of the temple, two dragons are crouching. បានហោះមកពីសុខចិនមកដល់កោះរងព្រោះដែលខ្ញុំគិតថាអឺនេះគឺតំណាងឲ្យសភាវៈសន្តិភាពនេះតំណាងឲ្យសភាវៈរីក